Hello and welcome to Alphonse Zeilais. My name is Johanna Nagelsbach. I am the grandniece of Alphonse Zeilais. We have the year 1900. Never has the technological development been as fast as now. If you wanted to know what new developments in technology existed, there was one place to go. The World Exhibition. The World Exhibition did not only show the newest technologies, it also left interesting things behind. What the population thought about that and what you could see there, I will tell you in this video. The year is 1900 and we are thus right at the dawn of the 20th century. During this time, technology is developing at an unprecedented speed fueling the belief in unlimited progress, unlimited possibilities and economic growth. Originally planned in 1851 by Prince Albert in Great Britain as a showcase of technology and arts and crafts, world exhibitions from the end of the 19th century served the purpose of self-expression by countries. Technical developments were no longer shown in the style of a trade fair, but were staged for the masses of visitors. At the 1900 world exhibition, as at previous world exhibitions, the countries, Europe and the USA, presented themselves in their own pavilions. These were built for the World Exhibition and disappeared again after the World Exhibition. The El Paso Daily Herald of the 26th of May 1900 described the World Exhibition in Paris as follows. Whatever else they may lack, the French are the masters of showmaking. Every visitor to the Paris Exposition of 1900 must admit this. There on the banks of the Seine, in the very heart of their gay and beautiful capital, they have fashioned out of steel and wood and stone and clay a fairy city which they have bid the world to come and look upon. Rising between two centuries, they have made visible summary of the past and set it off with a tangible forelook into the future. There you may see well housed the history of the old century and a builded prophecy of the new. So far the El Paso Daily Herald. Thematic exhibitions were offered in 18 pavilions with France occupying at least half of the space there. 56 nations occupied the other half of the space in these pavilions. The nations also presented themselves with one or more pavilions. Agricultural machinery, railroads and automobiles were shown in the suburb of Vincennes, which was accessible by metro via its first section of 10.6 kilometers. It should also be mentioned that the second Olympic Games of modern times were held at the same time as the World Exhibition, but were completely lost in the general hustle and bustle and were hardly noticed. The biggest innovation of the exhibition was the Chateau d'Eau, with the Palace of Light, a building over which about 4 million liters of water per hour from the Seine were let into a waterfall and in which energy for thousands of light bulbs was generated by means of turbines. Every evening at 9pm lightning flashed up the Eiffel Tower while a bright glow came down from above over 8000 lamps. The El Paso Daily Herald makes a point of noting that the technology for electricity would have been provided by French, English, German and American companies. Others would be nowhere near as advanced in technological development. Fortunately, the Eiffel Tower was only painted in colors for the World Exhibition. Dark orange at the bottom, yellow in the middle and gold at the top. Originally it was planned to cover it with plasterboard. Now the building which had been erected for the 1889 World Exhibition under massive protests from the population, but was now very well recognized, stood between plaster facades that were modeled on historicism. The population was definitely of the opinion that one can also overdo it with plaster. The Eiffel Tower stood like an iron huge throwing body between the plaster. The Eiffel Tower in any case remained at its place as is well known, 
even after this world exhibition. The giant Ferris wheel was also very well received by the public, first in Paris and then by the Viennese public at the Prater, where it was taken after the exhibition. The Trocadero was the site of the colonial exhibition. The coverage of this exhibition shows the attitude of what was then called the civilized world, namely Europe, the United States of America, and perhaps Japan and China towards the colonial world. This was differentiated into colonies to which the colonial powers granted civilization and culture, such as Cambodia, India, Algeria and Tunisia, and colonies which the colonial powers considered to have no history, mainly Sub-Saharan Africa. The newspaper Intelligenzblatt for Bergheim and Cologne of June 13, 1900 writes about the colonial exhibition of the World Exhibition. But the English presentation proves that, with the right business sense, there is a lot of money to be made in colonies. We Germans, above all the colonial experts, will be able to learn a lot in this English colonial house, which is actually several pavilions connected with each other. The centuries of British colonial practice are worth something. Such attitudes were instilled in children as early as school and shaped the entire generation. This cannot excuse the crimes of the colonial powers, but it can arouse understanding for propaganda mechanisms that promote the emergence of this attitude. However, the World Exhibition was also very interesting for the subject of art. The Grand Palais featured art that had been created since the last World Exhibition in Paris in 1889. The headline of an article in the New York Tribune Illustrated Supplement of August 12, 1900 on this is Recent French Art The work of the last 10 years at the exposition Honored Mediocrity The Saving Remnant Parisian Poetry and Idealism The Vein of Landscape Painting Horrors. What more can you add to this? What is more interesting, however, is that considerable attention was paid to design and the emergence of industrial design. Starting in 1871, the first craft and design schools were founded to better prepare a new generation of craftsmen and draftsmen to work for industry. Design by a system gradually took hold. By contrast, craft-based designers resisted industrial production, but saw the process of craft creation as essential. This included Art Nouveau, which sought to narrow the gap between art and craft design. It was about total works of art that the function of an object should determine its form. Today, one would say, form follows function. The German pavilion in the basement houses a restaurant in which the Berlin architect Bruno Möhring created one of the most beautiful and consistent Art Nouveau interiors of the entire world exhibition, which was actually in use. Perhaps these influences were decisive in Alfons Zahleis not going directly to the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich after graduating from high school, but first taking up studies at the School of Applied Arts in Nuremberg. Thank you for accompanying me to the World Exhibition 1900. It was a time of technological awakening. People believed they could achieve anything with technology. For Alphonse Zeilais, also his artistic awakening started. What Alphonse Zeilais did to become a famous painter, you will learn in the next video.